The following presentation will allow us to broaden the spectrum of, ex of our exchanges as it will focus on other aspects of open access such as research output and data sharing. More and more funding entities, institutions and of course researchers require that research data are made available for consultation and reuse, at least partially. Also, publishers might be the demanding party in that case in order to link publication and data. We have thought that for the researchers among you, it might be interesting to learn more about a research data repository of a very particular kind. Zenodo, implemented and hosted at CERN in Geneva and supported by other organizations such as Open Air, Open Access Infrastructure for Research in Europe, accepts data from all researchers and all scientific areas. I would now like to invite Ms. Mr. Lars Horn-Nielsen from the CERN IT Department, Collaboration and Information Service, but I first want to thank him very sincerely for having accepted to make this presentation on very short notice. I would also like to thank all people involved in the choice of the name Zenodos, which pays kind of tribute to our librarians from all over the world who try to, to accompany their institution and researchers on the difficult path of research data sharing. Because if I'm correct, Zenodo is derived from Zenodotus, the first librarian of the ancient library of Alexandria and father, father of the first recorded use of metadata, a landmark in library history. So, thank you for this name. <laughs> thank you. Well, yeah, my name is uh, Lars von Nilsen. I'm from CERN uh, IT department. And uh, I'm honored that uh, the organizers thought of me <laughs> last minute to, and invited me here. Um, so first of all, I'd like to ask uh, if there's anybody in the, in the audience who've tried to share their research data, or how many have, have tried that? Put a hand up. To share your research data in some way. Could be uh, on a website or something like that. Okay. That's a little, it's looking. Okay, so um, we've all heard about uh, publish and perish when it goes with uh, publications. It's not so with data. So first, I'd like to give a small uh, simplified overview of the, of the research data landscape nowadays. Uh, so we have, for instance, uh, big facilities. Um, there's a few uh, number of them. And of course, uh, CERN is, is one of the, the big one of these. Um, we produce, uh, we have these very uh, fast, high resolution cameras and can produce data at around 10, 10 petabytes a second. So much data we can't even uh, store that, okay? Uh, so we have some very sophisticated uh, systems to filter out uh, this data down to a rate that we can manage. And we have some uh, dedicated uh, data stores for storing this data, okay? Um, if we then look at the other end of the spectrum, we have the long tail of science. This is researchers distributed over the world. It's you. It's um, you're producing data in some way that you are writing your articles based on. Uh, if you're lucky, you have a subject-based data repository where you can put in your data set. Uh, you might be very lucky also to have an institutional uh, data repository where you can put it in. Um, however, it's probably very likely that your data set is sitting on your local hard drive or in Dropbox or in some, perhaps, uh, you, uh, your website. Um, and this is not really good for preservation because when your hard drive uh, goes down or you forget it somewhere or uh, you move an institution in five years, the data is gone. It's basically lost. Um, so, um, if you're a researcher nowadays, there's not so many options for actually sharing your data, and there's, uh, I don't really blame you for not doing it, because the, the solutions that are there today are really a bit clunky. It requires you to type in a lot of data, a lot of, uh, of, of things, and you don't really get any credit for it. Um, and, of course, we know that everybody is very busy nowadays, so, uh, so why do something you don't get, uh, get any credit for? Um, also, if you're an institutional repository, okay, then uh, managing 
large amount of, uh, of research data is not very easy. If you have a PDF file, that's five megabytes, okay? Then the other day from EPFL, I had a data set coming into Sonoto, which was uh, just eight gigabyte. Okay, there's a vast uh, uh, difference in the size uh, and the, the type of files that you have to manage when you have to do research data management. Um, so at CERN, we have uh, something like uh, 100 petabyte archive um, and uh, yeah, around 90,000 uh, computing cores in, in Geneva. And we have another five petabytes in, in Hungary. And computing and data management is at the heart of, of what we're doing. So um, what we're trying to do with Sonodo is leverage all the experience we have in research data man management to the long tail of science to you, that you can deposit your research data uh, in a place that is safe, where it's going to be stored for the future, uh, and we'll uh, do the best to make it, uh, make it readable in, in 20 years' time when we uh, upgrade it to, uh, to Word uh, 2030 or, or things like that. Um, so then I had this slide where the, the image has already been shown today. It's been the Library of Alexandria. It was in the first presentation. And we also already heard that the Synodotus, uh, that the, the name is derived from, was the first li librarian of the ancient library in Alexandria. Um, so what uh, does Synodo provide? Once you have uploaded your file, um, we integrate, for instance, our metrics that we've also heard about today. Um, this is provided by uh, Almetric.com, uh, and right now for, for resource data, it doesn't, the number doesn't mean so much, I would say. However, it's a very good tool to discover what is actually being talked about uh, about your, your, your data set. So you can see if there's readers on, on Mendeley or uh, if it's been tweeted by people, if it's been mentioned somewhere. Um, we also uh, link with uh, funding information if you provide that, uh, and we'll, uh, if you are funded by the, by the European Commission, we'll automatically send your, uh, your data to, into uh, the, the Cordis portal where it will be reported that you have uh, this, uh, this output. Um, we also create a digital object identifier, which is an ID and a promise that we are gonna, that you can use, uh, well, it's an ID. Um, you can use it in your references, and as long as you use the, the identifier to, it will always uh, go to the right place where the data set might be, uh, whether it's on Sonodo or somewhere else in the, in the future. Okay, so how do you upload your, your data? Well, um, it's pretty simple. You, you choose your files from your, from your local hard drive. You can even uh, select them from your, your Dropbox account if you have that one. Um, at the moment, we have um, a limit of two gigabyte per file. Uh, this is a bit arbitrary set in the beginning so that we can get a feeling of, uh, of the data that we're getting in. And, and of course, we also don't want to be the new uh, video sharing site. Um, uh, we have tested it up to around 10 gigabyte. Uh, and, and if you have a data set uh, that cannot be divided up to smaller two gigabyte files and come and talk to us and we can happily uh, work, work with you. Also, we have no upper limit of how much data you can store at the moment. We're working on a sustainability plan uh, and uh, we're probably gonna set a limit, a free limit uh, around 100 gigabytes, uh, but, uh, but that's still to be uh, decided. So once you upload the file, you have to specify a bit of metadata. Um, which is, uh, for instance, what type of, of file is it, okay? We support publications, posters, presentations, images, videos, data sets, uh, whatever you might have of research output. We accept everything. Um, this is a bit uh, old screenshot. We also added software types right now. So if you have uh, the, the software that goes together with analyzing your research data, you can also deposit that. Um, the only thing we require is that it's research related, which is a, a very wide term and is interpreted very, uh, very loosely. But uh, if you, for instance, start uploading a Hollywood movie and it's not, you don't have the permissions to it, we will uh, remove it again. Um, then uh, you also have to specify some, some access rights. And um, of course, we encourage users to, to deposit uh, open access. 
however, if you don't want to share your data set, it's also possible. Or if you have, if for instance, you have an article uh, and you want to put in the data set, uh, but not have it published until the article is actually published, you can also set an, an embargo for it. Um, yeah. So um, once, you, uh, once you hit the, the submit button, it takes roughly five minutes and then your, your article uh, is online. Uh, so then of course you might, uh, everybody can do this, so we, uh, we do a simple spam check once, uh, um, yeah, to see that it's, it's not a Hollywood movie or things like that and that it's research related, but we accept nearly everything, okay? This is primarily a, a preservation store. Also, uh, we accept any file formats. Um, when you are a uh, multidisciplinary repository like uh, Sonoro, then uh, we, we cannot restrict which kind of files comes up. Um, in the future, we'll try to tell you which, which are the good files you can put up that will be, read, be able to be read in, in 20 years' time and which are the bad ones. Um, and then also, uh, for the preservation, we'll try to, to build tools on top of Sonoro. Uh, that allows you to visualize your content so you have some kind of incentives to actually do it in the, in the right format. So uh, just to show you some of the, okay, uh, just to show you some of the, the, the things that have been deposited in Sonoro so far and the use cases of it, um, then for instance we have uh, Wiley who deposited a PDF file with, uh, that's called the Locks of Locks. It's a logbook of ship locations uh, that they use for atmospheric reconstruction. And this was a data set that didn't really fit into uh, the normal atmospheric uh, uh, data repository. We also had uh, eLife, which is a new um, uh, open access journal for research and life sciences, deposit a 700 megabyte uh, web application where you can browse uh, the genes related to an article. We have uh, Harvard Center for Astronomy the pub put, uh, publishing the gray literature. So they had um, um, uh, teaching material that uh, was no longer available for print. Uh, it was disappeared. So they had a copy that they could scan and, and put online. Um, also, we had the live snapshot from the, the Max Planck Institute for, for Chemistry that have a live uh, data set online. Uh, um, a uh, spectral atlas of, of gaseous molecule um, that they took a snapshot of and put in for preserving it for the future. Uh, and we had the EU projects uh, putting all their po posters and presentations inside. Um, a feature that we have in, uh, in Sonodo is that you, everybody can go in and create what we call a, a community. So if you're a publisher, if you're a, a library, or if you're just a, a research group that needs a place, to collect all your research data or posters or presentation or things like that. Um, you can create a community where you decide what, what actually gets displayed in there. Um, so you get to accept or reject whatever goes in uh, and you have uh, your special, uh, special upload area that people can, can upload things into. And you can actually export everything from your your community as well. So if you need to be integrated in PubMed Central or in, in NASA uh, Astrophysics Data System or some other uh, place where uh, other researchers go to find your work, you can use Sonodo as the place to store your, um, your data, but still have it harvested by these services and have it discoverable. Um, So it's pretty easy to, to create one of these communities. Everybody can do it. Um, just press, uh, go to communities, press the new button, and you have to uh, put a title and, and a description. So uh, one of the key lessons we've learned uh, at CERN lately, uh, over the past many years, building up a very large resource infrastructure is that you shouldn't try to uh, uh, decide how users are gonna use your system. You just build some very simple uh, infrastructure um, and then let users uh, use it in the way you empower the users to actually uh, to do what they want to do. Um, before we were trying to control how physicists actually had to analyze their data and that, uh, that didn't work very well in the end. Um, so under the hood of Zenodo, um, 
We have uh, Invenio uh, that is also running on, on here at uh, InfoScience. Uh, it's the latest uh, generation, so it's a bit uh, uh, in, in a newer version. It's also the, the uh, repository we are using for running uh, the high energy physics uh, um, literature database called Inspire and the certain uh, document repository. So we have a pretty large uh, um, amount of developers actually developing features for, for this system. Um, and that I was, uh, I was talking a little bit about that we have very large uh, storage infrastructure at CERN as well. And um, one of the, the main things that Sonoda can do for you is that we preserve your data. So that means that we, for instance, reread all the, the tapes to make sure that the, your, your data doesn't rotten, okay? Because your data can rot. Uh, people think that it's digital and there's no problems, but actually you can have problems uh, if you don't read the data and, and validate it, then you'll have a problem that after some years, then you actually won't be able to read it again. So that's called the uh, bit preservation, and we, uh, we do that uh, with all our research data ourselves, and Sonodo is just tagging along on, on these efforts we do at CERN. Um, in terms of uh, sustainability, then Sinodo has uh, two phases, okay? One is that um, it's part of, of a certain cloud infrastructure, a cloud service that you can call uh, open data as a, as a service. Um, another phase is that we are part of the Open Air plus EU project that provides uh, a repository for, for EU-funded research. Um, so we are exploring that for the long tail of science, it's gonna be free, and if you come one day and say, I want to store uh, 100 terabytes or a petabyte of data, okay, we'll have to somehow recover some of these costs because it is very expensive to store uh, one, one petabyte uh, of data per year. Um, so uh, in the future, we have lots of idea how to develop, uh, develop Sonodo. Um, In the end, it's gonna be the users who actually decide it. Uh, so if you come with requests, we will take them very serious. Uh, we don't believe in uh, developing something uh, cool without actually having a use, a use case for it. Some of the features coming right now is a uh, uh, visualization that you can actually visualize the data set um, that we'll put out uh, in a month's time. We also have an API that allows uh, computer uh, well, tech-savvy people to actually integrate Sonodo into the service you want to. So, for instance, there's um, a library or a journal uh, could integrate Sonodo in the, in the publishing process and simply uh, have Sonodo as, uh, as a preservation store in the background. Um, so, I think that's it. So, open for questions. Did everybody uh, know about Zenodo? Or was it a new discovery for you? Um, hello, thank you for your presentation. Um, you mentioned libraries. Could you give us an example maybe of a library who's currently using your services and how they're using it? Okay, so. Uh, so at the moment, for instance, the, the, the Harvard Center for Astronomy Library is using it to store gray literature in. Uh, we launched in, in May, so we're still uh, building up, uh, up the partnerships at the moment. Um, so the way I see uh, Sonodo can be used by a library is that um, actually having the capacity to store research data nowadays is, is not really possible in the current way the library works. It's very expensive and um, 
Zenodo can work as a, as a backend for that, where people deposit their data, but yet still the library can drag out this data again and integrate it in their own system. Uh, yeah. So you said Harvard, Harvard is using your, I didn't hear the name of yeah, the yeah. yet. Yeah, Harvard Center for Astronomy, like Astrophysics. And let's say if uh, the library has uh, in-house document that they don't want to share with other people, it's also possible to use your storage system. Uh, so you mean some kind of confidential data? Yes, like uh, maybe um, there is a, a business project and there is an outsider that um, paid for, for the data, but the, the library would like to keep it internally only, but not share mm. the information because it has commercial value. Mm. At, at the moment, um, we don't, we're not going to guarantee the, the confidentiality just because we haven't uh, looked through all the, all the processes. Um, we will go in that direction because it also comes, comes in with, uh, with medical research data, for instance, um, that you want to keep uh, confidential but only share with, with, uh, with certain uh, people that are capable of actually uh, treating this, uh, this data properly. Um, the model that we're going with is probably going to be that uh, you can store this closed access data on Zenodo and as long as you pay uh, for, for storing this closed access data, then uh, it will be there as soon as you don't pay anymore, you'll have to either remove it again or make it open access. Uh, because we make a promise to store this data and if it's not... Uh, if it's not accessible by, by other people, there's, there's uh, very little value in this research data, and as you're, not, uh, you're, yeah, you're basically not sharing the data. But it will be a possibility so as long as you Your pay. business model is if it's open access, um, then it's free, and if you don't want it to be open access, you're open to um, clients paying, in a way. Yeah, and it's, uh, so it's open if you, if you want to have it closed, and if you uh, have a very large amount of data, then we have to do some kind of, uh, of cost recovery, basically. Um, you will be able to deposit uh, some limited amount of closed access data, but it's going to be very limited. But otherwise, it's entirely free if people want to publish on your, on your so website. At, at, the store mo and, yeah. at the moment, yes. Uh, as at the moment, we are um, negligible uh, size compared to, to the 100 petabyte archive we have. Uh, so again, if you come with 100 terabytes, uh, we'll have to, <laughs> to, to rediscuss. Uh, just for your information, a, a petabyte of, of, of disk storage costs around uh, a million nowadays per year. Thank you very much. Uh, just a question about versions. For instance, if Harbor has a new version of a document, how do you do that? Do you have an automatic uh, upload system, or is it manual? Uh, at the moment, we don't uh, do versioning. It's on the, uh, on the horizon to actually deal with versioning, that you can upload a new document. Um, so one thing that the reason why we haven't done it straight away is that uh, we issue this digital object identifier. And uh, that's also a promise that the digital file actually didn't change. So if you upload a new data set, then we'll also have to create a new of these digital identifiers so that people who uh, once use your data actually refer back to the, uh, the correct data set. Uh, so uh, there's a bit more managing going, be going on behind the, the scenes and that's why it hasn't been implemented yet. Um, how do you differ from Figshare and Dryad? Uh, so Dryad, they only accept articles, uh, data related to peer-reviewed articles. We accept everything. Uh, and, um, and they also have a, a payment model. So you have to pay $80 for a data set. As soon as you go above a certain limit, you have to pay even more uh, for depositing this data set. Um, compared to... Uh, to Figshare, 
then we differ in the way that we are an international organization, we're not a commercial entity. And this is primarily a way to expose our research infrastructure. Uh, we cannot cater to the needs of, um, of uh, individual uh, libraries, Fixia will be able to do that. Um, but we have a plan for how to preserve our own research data for 20 years. Um, and and uh, Fixia, they, they don't really have such a plan. Uh, so I think we are more volatile against uh, economic uh, issues. And, yeah. Uh, you particularly talked about the social networking aspects and some of the data collected around that. Uh, what have you been doing specifically to raise the profile with researchers in that area? Uh, you mean the, the Elmetric? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, um, so at the moment we, we're mainly about storing the data. The, what we're trying to do is get the data out uh, of the researcher's hard drive because at the moment it's not being shared. So uh, that's, that's the first level. Um, this Elmetric uh, that we, uh, this Elmetric batch that we have, have put online um, is provided by another service. So we actually don't do much because it's not our core business. Our core business is to be able to provide the preservation storage. Uh, so we use other services that does a very great job in actually collecting these, these metrics. And, uh, and as I mentioned, then we see it as a great way for discovering what is going on about your data set and not as much about uh, a number of how good your, your data set is at the moment. Just a very rapid informative question. Is EPFL already working with Cenodo Infocions? Uh, are they collaborating together? Not officially, no. But we do have, uh, have uh, one or two data sets from EPFL researchers. We, we are not collaborating actively, but we have definitely selected Zenodo as one possible place where uh, people could host data sets that we do not have space for on the uh, InfoScience. So we have created a community uh, that has happened a little bit later than the, the first data sets uh, that have been uh, deposited already. So we'll try to find a way to uh, get this back together and we'll be able to uh, tell our researchers, yes, this is where you could put your your data if uh, you don't find uh, a subject uh, repository that is more interesting for you, more visible in your field, uh, for example. And uh, then in this case, Zenodo would be, uh, let's say, uh, I, I would not say a, a last resort solution, but uh, <laughs> a comfortable fallback plan. <laughs> And I, uh, I can also add that, of course, we are collaborating on the, on the underlying system, the software called Envinio. So we have a good collaboration with Gregory uh, Favre. So, um, yeah. Um, I have one question about uh, connecting InfoScience and Zenodo. Um, how do you, do you plan to connect the reference with the publication in InfoScience to the uh, data in Zenodo, uh, because there will be a DOI for Zenodo, but there, there will also be a DOI for the publication, so um, how do you connect both? So there's, there's, um, the option you have today is that uh, when you deposit in Zenodo, you can specify related uh, publications or data set, and you put just copy-paste the DOI in, and, and we take care of the linking. Um, another possibility is that um, it's another another option we're working with is that we have a Sonoda button that you can put on the, the article page, um, and then you click the button, you go to Sonoda, and we'll do the linking automatically for you, so you don't even have to copy paste the, the identifier. Uh, 